Well, forgiveness is one of those actions that all Christians need to do from time to time. And we know there are many commands and examples and encouragements that deal with this important topic in the Bible. Now in the Old Testament, the idea of forgiveness was mainly centered around God and His forgiving nature in relation to His chosen people who continually strayed into sin and disbelief and the worship of idols and so on and so forth. We see this in the language itself since in Hebrew there's no single word for forgiveness, but instead they have a series of images connected to God. For example, the word salak uh, means pardon, but always used with God as the subject. It was first used in Exodus 34 verse seven where God reveals his character by listing various divine uh, traits. And one of them was, one who forgives iniquity being one of these things. Another uh, Hebrew word, kiper, uh, atonement it meant, or paying a ransom. It's found over a hundred times in the Old Testament referring to the action that reconciles God and uh, human beings. Uh, it's an action that precedes pardon and uh, in the relationship between God and man, it's always attributed to God. It is always God who pays the ransom price, never, never man. And then the word uh, nasa, uh, the taking away of an offense. Again, in the context of human offenses, it is always God who accomplishes this thing. We read in Psalm 32, five, I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave, God is the one that always does the forgiving, you forgave the guilt of my sin. So as far as Old Testament, uh, the Old Testament is concerned, the language and the examples of forgiveness, as I said at the outset, is focused mainly on God and the forgiveness that He shows towards His people. Now, there are instances of interpersonal forgiveness in the Old Testament record but these are described as acts and attitudes of mercy and generosity towards others who are subordinate or undeserving of mercy for some reason or another. For example, the spies who spared Rahab and her family in Joshua 2, um, uh, 12 to 14. Uh, David showing mercy to Saul's grandson uh, Mephibosheth uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 9. Or Esau taking back his vow to kill his brother Jacob and reconciling with him instead in Genesis uh, 33. And Joseph uh, in not taking revenge on his brothers who sold him into Egyptian slavery, uh, but instead comforted and encouraged them when their father Jacob died. We read about that in Genesis uh, chapter 50. So in these and other episodes we see forgiveness in action, uh, but the writers in describing the various scenes and interactions between the people, they do not use the language of forgiveness. Instead they use words like merciful or kindness or finding favor and so on and so forth. You don't find the word, you don't hear Joseph say, I forgive you. You don't see that. The thought, of course, uh, the thought being that actual forgiveness, in other words, the removal of guilt, the wiping away of sin was strictly associated with God, not man. The point I'm trying to make is in the Old Testament, you don't see one man forgiving, taking the offense away from another man. It's always God who is doing that, uh, for men. Human beings were merciful to each other, kind to each other, you know, so on and so forth, but that word forgive does not describe what they're doing. And so humans at, at a certain point in the Old Testament become associated with forgiveness later on when the law and the sacrificial system is given to Moses. People will now be part of the process of forgiveness but only as intermediaries in serving as priests and Levites and offering animal sacrifices and maintaining the place where this mode of worship to God and the forgiveness offered 
uh, are attached to these sacrifices. So again, men are participating now in the process of forgiveness, but only as servants of the, uh, the temple and only as servants of the altar uh, where forgiveness uh, is given to man, again, through God, through the, uh, the sacrificial system that man is now participating in. The removal of sin and the forgiveness for offenses, however, remain the exclusive purview of God. The difference now being that man participates in the ritual that conveys the manner in which forgiveness from God is attained. Uh, Joseph demonstrated this God-centered concept of forgiveness when in answer to his brothers who asked him, you know, they asked him to forgive them for the past. They were afraid, you know, their father died and they thought of the terrible things that they did, you know, where they sold him into slavery and now that their dad, their father was dead, they thought, wow, now's the time. He can, he, he can visit revenge on us now. He, he's in a powerful position uh, in Egypt. And what does, uh, what, what does uh, Joseph answer? He said, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? He doesn't say anything more, but you know, the intention is, am I in the position of God to give you forgiveness? Joseph understood, God is the one that does the forgiveness, not me. And so they asked for forgiveness, and he offered mercy and encouragement, leaving to God the pardon, the forgiveness, the removal of sin. Requests for person-to-person -person forgiveness are never fully granted in the Old Testament because they understood that complete forgiveness could only be given by God. In the New Testament, however, we see a change when it comes to forgiveness. So, so far we've done a little preamble here about the idea of forgiveness in the Old Testament between human beings. In the New Testament, man is not simply part of the ritual process to obtain forgiveness from God, people are now commanded to forgive one another. For example, in Ephesians 4 it says, or Paul writes, be kind to uh, one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. And then in Matthew 18 he says, then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him, up to seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. So we see here that Christians are both encouraged and commanded to forgive. What has changed from the Old Testament to the New? Well, what has changed is that Christ has provided the sacrifice, the atonement, the restitution for all the sins that have ever been committed. Uh, Peter talks about that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And so if a Christian sins against you somehow, the payment or the moral restitution for that sin owed to God has already been made by Jesus Christ. And so when you as a Christian forgive another Christian, the slate is clean between you and them as well as the slate between them and God because of Christ. When, however, an unbeliever sins against you, your forgiveness sends them before God with a request of mercy from you on their behalf. This frees you from the temptation to seek revenge and it fulfills the command to love our enemies. Now, the most asked question about forgiveness is not about the difference between the Old Testament idea there and the New Testament on this topic, but rather, how do I forgive? How do I do that? In other words, many people want to offer forgiveness to someone else for one reason or another, but they're not sure how to actually do it. Sure, it begins by saying, I forgive you, but what does my brain and what does my heart and what does my spirit have to actually do to forgive sincerely and to keep that forgiveness in place as time goes by? This is why this lesson is entitled The Mechanics of Forgiveness, because I'm going to try to explain what the Bible says we are to do to actually forgive someone or something. You know, sometimes it's not always a person that injures us or offends us. Sometimes it's a thing, right? It's an organization like a business or a team or a school or the government 
that has hurt us or offended us or cheated us in some way. And, and in many ways, forgiving, let's say, an organization is sometimes a lot more difficult than forgiving a person because the organization doesn't have a face, doesn't have one individual, it's, it's the whole thing together. All right, so let's begin by getting an idea about the various meanings of forgiveness. Because you cannot do something without first understanding what it is that you are trying to actually do. So let's get some definition, shall we? So the dictionary, Webster's definition, general concept. Well, according to the dictionary, forgiveness is uh, uh, you stop feeling anger towards someone who has done something wrong or done something wrong to you. Uh, to stop blaming someone for having failed or failed you. Or to stop requiring payment, whether it's money or an apology or whatever it is, to make restitution for a wrong committed. That's the Webster's Dictionary of Forgiveness. Psychology, psychologists definition. You know, Greater Good Magazine out of UC Berkeley, they have some definitions of forgiveness. To consciously and deliberately decide to release feelings of resentment or vengeance towards someone or a group who has harmed you, regardless of whether they actually deserve or are aware of your forgiveness. So that's, that's the psychologist. If you go to a, uh, uh, you go to a counselor and, and you're talking about your need to forgive this or that, this is what they're going to be shooting for. And then you have, in general, the Bible's definition. Like the dictionary in modern psychology, the Bible defines forgiveness as pardoning an offender. The Greek word for forgiveness literally means to let go to let go, as when a person does not demand payment for a just debt owned. I'm letting it go. I, I, I'm just, you owed me this, I'm letting it go. That's forgiveness. The main difference between the dictionary and psychology's definition and that of the Bible is that unlike the other two sources, the Bible sees forgiveness as a lifestyle and not simply a one-time event. A forgiving nature is part of your lifestyle. This is not so according to the dictionary or pop psychology. Uh, Jesus included forgiveness as a cornerstone of a Christian's life when he included this gracious act as part of the Lord's prayer, right? What did he say? And forgive us our sins for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into a temptation, Luke 11.4. Likewise, in his parable of the unmerciful slave, Jesus equated forgiveness with the canceling of a debt owed, Matthew 18. You know, we forgive others when we let go of anger or resentment and the desire for revenge, as well as any claim to be compensated for hurt or loss that we have suffered. I, it's a big thing. You know, I may be just reading it through here and explaining it as if you know, I'm not putting a lot of emotion into it. This is probably more of a class than a sermon. But forgiving someone for a real hurt is a big thing emotionally. It's traumatic. Okay? And so we forgive others when we let go of the anger and resentment and the desire for revenge as well as any claim for compensation. Again, unlike the dictionary or psychology, the Bible provides a motive for forgiveness beyond practical and pragmatic motives like, well, it's the right thing to do, or it's the best way to have peace and quiet. It's a good way to improve relationships. Those things are all true, but that's not the motivation that the Bible gives. The Bible, the Bible sets unselfish love, agape, as the primary reason and motive to offer forgiveness to someone who has hurt us in some way. Paul speaks of this type of motivation for forgiveness in his great passage on Christian love in 1 Corinthians 13. In it, what does he say about this particular thing? Love does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, and here it is, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. 
take into account, wait a minute, I'm going, what you just did, I'm writing it down here, and this is on the agenda, I've just started an invoice, I've started an emotional invoice for you, and you're in the red, buddy, you owe me. What he's saying here, the image of it is, does not take into account, does not open up an account for you. That all of a sudden now this other person owes you because of what has taken place. Love does not operate that way. And so the Bible presents forgiveness as a gracious act by a Christian who bears no ill will or threat of justice for injury suffered. Instead, offering forgiveness in exchange for offense. Forgiveness motivated by sacrificial, sacrificial love, of course, modeled by Christ and His cross. All right, so um, uh, let's take, th that's what forgiveness is, right? We, we're letting go. I have more to say on that, but first of all, let's look at what forgiveness is not because there are people that have really weird ideas about what they think forgiveness is or ought to be, okay? So let's do a couple of what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not condoning offensive behavior. Somebody does something nasty, somebody speaks out of turn, somebody is uh, uh, impolite, someone says something which is untrue, hurtful, and we say, oh, well, that's no big deal. You know, it's all right, it's okay, let's just forget about it. You know, uh, we don't recognize that what has happened is, is awful, is insulting, is hurtful. Forgiveness is not saying, oh, it's nothing, yeah, it's okay. You know. It's not okay. It's not okay. The Bible actually condemns those who claim that bad actions are harmless or acceptable in Isaiah chapter five. So forgiveness is not just you know, whitewashing over something which is genuinely wrong or hurtful. Forgiveness is not pretending that the offense never happened. For example, I don't need forgiveness and I don't need to be forgiven because I've not done anything wrong. You know that attitude? God not only forgave King David his sins when he acknowledged them, he let him experience the consequences of them and he even recorded them in the Bible so we could learn from his experience today. There is no healing without revealing. No healing without revealing. No healing <clears throat> for the injured party and no healing for the one who has caused the offense unless we acknowledge that there is an offense. Forgiveness is not telling others to take advantage of you. Suppose you lend someone money and instead of paying you back, they waste it and then they don't pay it or refuse to pay it. This person might come to apologize after a time and you know, ask for more time to repay if they could you might be forgiving by accepting his apology and perhaps even canceling the entire debt. This would be true forgiveness. However, if this person comes back and renews his call for you to lend him more money, wisdom and prudence on your part would direct you to avoid becoming involved with this person financially. <laughs> You're not being forgiving by being taken advantage of. That's not forgiveness, that's foolishness. Forgiveness is not pardoning with no basis. You know, God does not forgive people who are guilty of willful, malicious sin and who refuse to acknowledge or repent of their behavior or apologize to those they have hurt. Yes, the cross of Christ is, is available for everyone, the worst sinner in the world. The blood of Christ is available, but you have to avail yourself of it. You have to come to that cross. What does Solomon say, Proverbs 28? He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. How blessed is the man who fears always, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. 
You know, there's no need to forgive those who God has not forgiven. When offended or injured by one of these people where they will neither ask for nor receive forgiveness, the goal for the injured party is to avoid being consumed by rage and resentment and anger. Go to another Old Testament passage in Psalm 37, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil doing. Trust that God will eventually bring these people into account. Hebrews 10, remember that God will bring a time when we will no longer feel the deep pain or hurt that burden us now because of the hurt and injury we've suffered from people who are unkind to us or have been unfair or unjust with us. Forgiveness is not forgiving every perceived offense and, and slight. In other words, forgiveness is not, I'm always in forgive mode. Because sometimes we may be just a little too sensitive and what is needed is not forgiveness, but we need to have a bit of a tougher and patient attitude. You know, Paul, go back to 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, you know, love is not sensitive, meaning easily offended. Some people take offense just a little too easily. Solomon's wise advice in, uh, in Ecclesiastes speaks clearly to this very issue. What does he say? Do not be eager in your heart to be angry, for anger resides in the bosom of fool. What is it? Eager in your heart to be angry. Well, that's being sensitive, overly sensitive, overly touchy. You, know, you say two words that go in the wrong way, and boy, some people just they blow up right away. All right, so enough about you know, what forgiveness is not. Let's talk about the mechanics of forgiveness. We've looked at the definitions of forgiveness, you know, letting go, some misunderstandings of this particular virtue. Now I'd like to describe the mechanics of forgiveness and these boil down to three separate actions. These three are the things that we have to actually do and think and feel for forgiveness to actually take place in our hearts. Because anger and the desire for revenge begins in the heart. This is the place where forgiveness also needs to begin and displace these and other negative emotions. All right, so the mechanics of forgiveness. What do, what do I have to do, number one? You have to define the offense clearly and truthfully. That's the first thing. You, you, nothing happens in the process of forgiveness if you have not defined the offense clearly and truthfully. You can't forgive something if you don't know or can't articulate what the offense is. You know, in the case of a cheating spouse, the real offense isn't only the sexual infidelity, also, although this you know, could be pretty painful to contemplate. It's the lying that accompanies and supports the infidelity. All my years of counseling of people that have gone through this terrible experience, couples that have gone through this terrible experience, tried to put their marriage back together again. This is a conversation, I mean, almost word per word. Uh, one person, whoever, you know, the, 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 the one who cheated, uh, or has been cheated on, that person said, you know, I could almost you know, just get rid of that image in my mind, but it's the lying that I can't take. The lying is like a multiplier that heightens the level of pain and the damage done to the relationship. The sex may have only happened you know, once or a few times, but the dishonesty was 24 hours a day and seven days a week. The offended party needs to forgive the adultery itself, of course. But until the lying is also dealt with and forgiven, the episode will continue to cause pain and sorrow and anger. I use uh, the example of uh, David and Bathsheba in 2 Samuel. You know, we don't have to read all of that. We're familiar with the story of David and Bathsheba. David, the king, saw this woman bathing and sent for her. 
she became pregnant and David then sent for her husband to return home from the battle in the army that the army was waging at the time, thinking that this man would then be with his wife and this way they could cover up the pregnancy. When this didn't work, David had Uriah, the woman's husband, he had Uriah, the husband, killed. And he took the young widow as his wife. God then sent Nathan the prophet to confront David about his sin. And this is the section I would like to read, however. It says, then the Lord sent Nathan to David and he came to him and said, there were, two rich, uh, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor, and the rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he uh, bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and his children. It would eat out of his, bread, uh, of his bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom and was like a daughter uh, to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd, to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die. He must make restitution for the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and had no compassion. Nathan then said to David, you are the man. I was talking about you. Notice that Nathan's story did not suggest sexual lust, did not suggest recklessness as the root cause of David's many sins in this episode, but rather a callous heart and a hardened conscience that allowed him to do these things. That little story, do you see anywhere in that story the, 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 that, the, that the, the rich man, that you see there, anything about sex, anything about love? No. If you just hear that story, you're saying, man, what a, you know, what a creep, what a hard-hearted guy. And that's, that's, that was David's problem. I mean, think now. A callous heart that led him to take for himself a woman whose husband Uriah was one of his devoted group of 30 personal bodyguards committed to his personal safety. These men were ready to die to protect David. And what does David do? He takes this man's woman and then has him killed. He plots uh, uh, to have this noble soldier killed for what? in order to cover his adultery with the man's wife. And then what else does he do? Well, he lies to the nation and he goes on as if nothing happened, thinking that there would be no consequences. He did not go to God in prayer asking for forgiveness. Instead, God sent Nathan to accuse and uncover what David tried to keep secret. God, through Nathan, revealed what the core sin was, David's hardness of heart which enabled him to cheat and lie and murder without a peep from his conscience. You know, many times we make an attempt to forgive and we just say, yeah, yeah, sure, I forgive you or I forgive them or I forgive, you know, it's like a, a one size fits all forgiveness. But as time goes on, we continue to experience the internal pain and stress caused by the offense. We keep going over it in our mind. We debate the fairness or the results. We continue to experience anger and resentment and frustration and sorrow despite our blanket forgiveness. You know, we said, yeah, yeah, it's all, it's, we're good, it's, uh, you're forgiven. But we keep churning inside, we keep hurting inside. Well, when this happens, it's usually because we haven't gotten to the true source of our offense. You know, getting to the true offense is like you know, finding the right tap to turn off when your house is being flooded with water. A little while back, Lisa and I went out of town uh, on vacation, visit some folks, and we came back, and, you know, and, and all of she comes in the garage and she said, boy, I hear a noise, you know, I hear a noise. <laughs> and when we walk into the house, that noise was water coming out of some hose in the back of the refrigerator. And, and our kitchen was flooded, you know, it had an inch of water there. And it was the, uh, it was the hose that connects you know, the water, that brings the water to the refrigerator for the ice maker. 
And so I knew that there were you know, taps to turn off, but under our sink we got a whole bunch of different taps. So I, you know, she was there you know, looking at the thing and I was trying to turn a tap off. What about that one? No, 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 it's still coming out. She said, well, I try another one. What about that one? No, no, it's still coming out. And finally, down at the bottom in the back, I finally found one little one and I turned it off. Yes, yes, she said, the water stopped. Well, of course it was a mess. You know, we had towels everywhere to sop up the water. And, you know, it was a mess. But at least the water stopped flowing. You know? At least there was a stop to the damage. Well, my point here is that until you find the true source of the offense and turn it off through forgiveness, it will continue to leak negative emotions despite the general all-purpose forgiveness that you may have offered in the past, many times done just to get things over with quickly and move on. Yeah, 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 I forgive you. Can we just move on? Yeah, not a good way to go. So as far as the mechanics of forgiveness is concerned, number one, you have to identify exactly what the offense was. Otherwise, you're not able to turn the tap off. Number two, you have to let go. Yeah, really, let go. Some people say, well, you have to forgive and you have to forget. You know, forgive and forget. This is a noble sentiment, but it is unrealistic because something said or done to you that requires forgiveness usually has an impact that probably can never be forgotten. The important thing to remember about forgiveness is that you don't have to forget in order to accomplish sincere forgiveness, but you do have to let go. As mentioned earlier in this lesson, the actual Greek word translated into the English word forgive means to let something or someone go. I think most of us understand this idea of letting go, but are not sure how this letting go is actually done. Yeah, I want to let go, but how? How do I do it? Well, here are some practical ways to do this. Practical ways to let go. First of all, understand that forgiving others their offense is not optional, it's a command. Jesus said that God continues to forgive us as we forgive others. This is helpful information for those who are dithering back and forth over whether or not they should forgive somebody's offense against them. Knowing that offering forgiveness is a command, the neglect of which has consequences, you know, has a way of focusing the mind and it gives direction to our actions. You know, why should I forgive? You know, sometimes, why should I forgive? I, I didn't, boy, their apology didn't seem that sincere to me. And you know, if I forgive, maybe it'll happen again. You know, why should I do it? Well, reason number one, because God has commanded you to do it. Another way to let go. Stop the mental churning. You know, you know what churning is? You know, in the old days, you used to make butter, right? Churn, you know, stir it around, stir it around, stir it around, churning. In other words, resist the temptation to go back and relive the episode when and where the offense took place. Paul teaches that Christian love does not take into account a wrong suffered. I, this is the third time I've quoted that, 1 Corinthians 13, 5. The idea is that a forgiving heart does not keep score for the purpose of revenge or for the purpose of review. Forgiveness does not blot out the offense from our memory, but it has dealt with the offense itself, so there is no need to go back and review it and relive it. You know that expression, been there, done that? People say that all day, oh, been there, done that. Well, when you're tempted to go back to relive and re-churn and re-prosecute you know, re you know, the old offense, say to yourself, been there, done that. I've been to that place and I've offered forgiveness. There's no purpose to go back. Been there, I've done that. I'm done with that. The practical way of doing this is to change our habit 
of continually looking backwards and follow Paul's admonition to look to the future and what the future holds for all Christians. What does he say in, a, uh, in Philippians chapter three? But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, what, what lies behind? All the dumb, stupid, nasty, offensive, sinful things that I did, and all the dumb, nasty, stupid, offensive things that other people have done to me. That's in the past. Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ to Jesus. All of that to say, I look forward to heaven. That's the call, what am I called to? I'm called to heaven. Looking back at offenses and failures is one of Satan's tactics in keeping us spiritually immobilized. If we're consumed by the past and its hurts, we come to a standstill in our Christian walk since there is nothing we can do to change or affect the past. Looking forward, however, focuses us to, or forces us rather, to mobilize our spiritual resources. It creates hope and joy in us and it limits the ways that Satan and the world can negatively affect us. When I am tempted to go back to relive something, I say to myself, been there, done that. I have forgiven so and so for that, or I have been forgiven for that. There is nothing there for me anymore. And you can be sure it's never the Lord, it's never the Lord that forces you to look backwards. He always asks you to look forward because that's where He is. The only thing of consequence in my past is the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing of consequence. And the only thing of consequence in the future is heaven. And so I live between the cross and heaven. That's where I'm at. That's where I stay. Letting go requires the personal discipline to resist the temptation, to uh, repeatedly fight the battles of the past and remain focused on the victory that awaits us in the future. All right, the mechanics of forgiveness. Number three, cancel the debt. Cancel the debt. In the parable of the ungrateful servant, in Matthew 18, <clears throat> who was forgiven his debt by his master, but after being set free, refused to forgive a fellow servant of a debt owed to him. As a result, that servant lost his freedom. Now an interesting feature of this parable is the simple way it demonstrates the basic idea of forgiving, and that is simply the canceling of a debt, right? The servant owed his master a debt he could never pay. I think it was 10,000 talents. Well, I did a little research. 10,000 talents is seven billion dollars today. <laughs> the master waved away a repayment plan. He simply canceled the debt that he was owed. You don't owe it to me anymore. Now, the point of the parable is not, how did a servant rack up so much debt? <laughs> and what master would, 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 would permit you know, such an account, that's not the point of the parable. The point of the parable is that we owe God a debt we cannot pay and God cancels the moral debt that we have by paying it off through the cross of Jesus Christ. Now for the purpose of my lesson, the point this parable teaches us is that forgiveness requires us to cancel the debt that others owe us because of how they have offended and hurt us. When offended or cheated or hurt, we are owed something. We're owed justice or an apology or some form of compensation. Forgiveness means that we release the offender from their obligation to repay these things to us. Some people, you know, they won't forgive because revenge or the threat of it is what helps them deal with the hurt and damage caused by the original offense. The problem here is that the healing doesn't start until the debt is paid. 
Forgiving, right? Canceling the debt puts control for the healing and the closure and peace into the hands of the offended party, not the guilty party, who rarely can give or do what will bring peace, and not the justice system that simply decides who gets how much money, and definitely not Satan, whose only interest is to prolong the suffering. <laughs> if we only knew that Satan's objective is not only to make us suffer in hell, is to make us suffer here as well, to take away any moment of joy that we might have. And so the benefits of forgiveness, emotional freedom, peace of mind, closure with the past, and spiritual satisfaction because the right and Christ-like thing has been done, all of these benefits only come when we consciously and deliberately articulate the offense against us and who caused it. It helps us when we let go the negative feelings and desire for revenge by refusing to dwell on the past and remain focused on Jesus our Lord and the life that He's given us now as well as the heavenly reward promised in the future. And thirdly, as I've just mentioned, canceling the debt. Whatever is rightfully owed to you Free yourself from this debt by giving it to Jesus to collect a judgment. And you can be sure that He will collect the debt. Remember that the first step to personal healing and peace of mind, not to mention possible reconciliation with other people, that first step is forgiveness. Once the debt is canceled, you can go back to living your life in Jesus Christ. Now I know a lot of people are thinking, oh, but what about if you know, we had a car accident and, you know, and there's a lawsuit and I was injured? Well, that's a whole different thing. Obviously, you know, if somebody smashed your car and your car is worth $20,000, well, we have insurance and we have courts that take care of those things and so on and so forth. I'm really talking about the interpersonal relationships that we have. No, nobody's going to go to hell because you know, their car got smashed up and uh, you know, they didn't get as much money as they wanted to from the, the settlement. But we risk losing our soul if we refuse to you know, forgive a sister in Christ who has said something or done something that has hurt our feelings and we maintain that resentment, not just for days, but for years. That's what I'm talking about. Speaking of debts, I'd be remiss if I didn't remind us that all of us have a sin debt owed to God and the mechanics of His forgiveness in sin are quite simple. Those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God and express that faith in repentance and baptism, they receive not only forgiveness, but the indwelling of God's Spirit as well. And so if anyone's here tonight, they realize, hey, I have a sin debt and that debt has not been taken care of through the cross of Christ, or maybe, you know, this is a teaching lesson, maybe I need help in forgiving. I, I, I need somebody to pray for me so that I have the strength to forgive someone else. Or maybe I need help and prayer because I, I have not received forgiveness from someone else. And maybe that person is gone. You know what the hardest thing is? You need forgiveness from someone who's died. That's a very difficult thing. And so, you know, you can't say everything there is to say about a topic in 30 minutes. But hopefully what I've shared with you will help you understand what is necessary in your mind and in your heart uh, to offer forgiveness to those who need your forgiveness. All right. So if you have a need for prayer or you need to respond to the gospel invitation to, be, uh, to repent and be baptized, well, we're going to sing a song of invitation as we do normally. And if you need to respond in any way, just come on down or fill out a card and we'll be happy to minister to you then.